I will introduce him. I just wanted to point it out to our slides, uh, which are flashing in front of you, and uh, you will be able to see a new building, and that will house uh, many vision researchers on one floor. I would say maybe uh, 20 or so, uh, maybe a little bit less. And again, I hope uh, the biggest talent that attends, or this is that building, the biggest talents that attending those seminars uh, hopefully will populate that building as, as we expand our research program. So with this little advertisement, let me just move on and uh, ask the Samir to introduce our speaker. Good morning. My name is Samir Mahotra, a PhD student at Dr. Brown's lab. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our distinguished seminar speaker, Dr. Aaron Lee. Dr. Aaron Lee is a distinguished professional whose academic and medical journey has been marked by excellence and dedication. He completed his medical education at the Washington University School of Medicine, earning both his Master of Science in Clinical Investigations and Doctor of Medicine degrees in 2009. Dr. Lee further honed his expertise through postgraduate training, including residency at Washington University School of Medicine and fellowships at University of British Columbia in Vancouver and Moore's Field High Hospital in London. Currently, Dr. Lee is an associate professor of ophthalmology and an affiliate professor of eScience Institute at the University of Washington. Dr. Lee's research focuses on the convergence of large clinical medical data sets and non-traditional computing techniques. He has pioneered the application of novel visualizations derived from cloud and cluster-based computing environments. From processing next-generation sequencing data in supercomputing environments to analyzing big data sources, Dr. Lee has led the charge in leveraging AI technology to advance ophthalmic research. His research has been supported by the National Institutes of Health Common Fund, National Eye Institute, Carl Zeiss Meditech, Research to Prevent Blindness, and Lowy Medical Research Institute, and many more. In addition to his research endeavors, his clinical expertise lies in vitro, vitro retinal and macular diseases, including epiretinal membranes, macular hole repair, retinal detachment repair, and hereditary macular dystrophies. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Aaron Lee, where he will present his talk titled Frontiers of Deep Learning and Ophthalmology. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, all right, uh, so it's a distinct pleasure to give this uh, talk and to be invited uh, to the seminar series. Um, I'll jump right in. These are my financial disclosures. Uh, I kind of wanted to start this talk by giving you a introduction to some of these concepts if you're not familiar with them, and then um, talking about my journey in particular and where I think the field is sort of moving next. Uh, so I'd like to kind of start off by saying that we are firmly living as human society in this era of big data and machine learning. It's, it's been called the fourth industrial revolution. It has uh, these algorithms and data is flowing all around us. Every time we open our phones, every time we do anything uh, with our email, um, there are algorithms that are watching and uh, what we do and how we behave and how we interact with data and deciding what kinds of contents would be served next uh, and influencing your behavior. And so this is a very interesting time in human history where both the compute and data are have advanced enough uh, to allow these things to occur. Um, it's always nice to also define these terms a little bit because I feel like the news media uh, uses these terms uh, interchangeably uh, and it's very, very confusing. Even in the medical literature, uh, authors uh, inadvertently use these terms uh, incorrectly. So the field of artificial intelligence is actually very, very old. It's been around since the dawn of modern computing, um, and it encompasses a whole family of different algorithms. Uh, one subfield within AI is called machine learning. And within machine learning, there's a relatively new field uh, called deep learning, which came into um, you know, vogue as a term around 2014, 2015 or so. So it's, it's a fairly new field. Um, to understand what deep learning is, you 
sort of have to understand what artificial neural networks were. Uh, this was considered state of the art in machine learning uh, circa 1980 to 1990. Um, they thought there was a period of time, uh, there was a, what they called an AI summer during that time, where they thought that uh, these artificial neural networks were going to take over medicine and replace doctors. Uh, and this dialogue that we're having today um, has actually been uh, repeated you know, a few times before. These neural networks, there was some severe limitations with them in that we could only train maybe one to three uh, layers at the time. Um, and that was a limitation both with the, with the algorithmic mathematics as well as um, the compute uh, available at the time. So in, in, my, uh, in my opinion, there were sort of four things that happened that came together around the same time that gave birth to what we call deep learning today. Uh, first, it was a realization that these graphics cards uh, could be used for linear algebra computations. Uh, it turns out the uh, gaming industry, as they were developing cores that could rotate polygons in three-dimensional space, turned out to be a very, very efficient um, uh, uh, linear algebra uh, 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 compute engines. Um, second was these convolutional filters uh, that were spatially aware. Um, and so these were able to exploit the local coherence uh, in uh, pictures. Uh, so neighboring pixels were able to, uh, to take advantage of that, whereas the fully connected models before um, destroyed that spatial relationship. Uh, the third was the use of these nonlinear activation functions that allowed models to go deeper than one to three layers. And then finally, our uh, compute hardware and data collection efforts had uh, uh, given rise to this era of what we call big data today, where there was these large data sets that were available uh, to train these models. And so we live in this really exciting time now where uh, as you feed uh, these models and you make them larger and larger and larger, and you feed them more and more data, their performance just seems to increase and increase and increase. Um, and so, you know, uh, at one point in time was, you know, deep learning models with convolutional uh, neural networks and vision models. And now if you think about what's happening with uh, GPT and chat, uh, uh, GPT-4 and chat GPT, uh, it, it, it's a really good embodiment of what this graph sort of represents. Um, so I want to recount uh, my journey into this because it was um, very serendipitous uh, in many ways. Um, uh, I had just joined faculty at University of Washington. Um, and one of the first things I did uh, with no real purpose in mind at the time um, was I extracted all the OCT imaging that was in our clinical data sets uh, from routine clinical care, as well as go into the EHR and uh, grab these var uh, variables and link them together. And I, I had done this around, you know, 2014, 2015, and it was sitting on hard drives uh, on my uh, computers, and I didn't know what to do with it because there was really not much you could do at that time with a bunch of images and this, these kinds of clinical data, metadata at the time. Um, one of my uh, friends got me in touch with uh, some folks at NVIDIA and they uh, were trying to promote, you know, other fields outside of computer science to use uh, deep learning. And they sent me a few graphics cards. Um, and one of the first uh, things that I did uh, was to try uh, what I thought was sort of the simplest problem uh, to see if this technology actually worked. Um, so I trained a model that could uh, that took a, uh, about five hundred thousand normal, uh, sorry, fifty thousand uh, normal B scans and fifty thousand uh, macular degeneration B scans, uh, and I tried to train a binary classifier using a uh, a model called BGG sixteen, which was a state of the art at the time, uh, to do this classification task. And in uh, like thirty six hours, um, I had trained my first model and achieved these uh, uh, performance metrics, and it blew my mind. Um, I thought uh, I had done something wrong. The tools available for doing training deep learning models were very rudimentary at the time. Uh, uh, and I thought I had made some sort of mistake that had leaked the label into the training set, um, and the models were cheating because there was, this seemed uh, in, in, too good to be true. 
Um, and that sort of gets at this problem that we face even today, uh, that these models are black boxes um, and we really can't understand why they work and how they work. Uh, we have some post hoc visualization methods like an occlusion based method where we systematically occlude every pixel position and we see what happens uh, to the drop in performance. Um, and when we did that uh, with this model, um, it indeed highlighted areas uh, that uh, seemed clinically relevant for making uh, this binary decision. And so that made me feel a lot better about publishing uh, uh, that very first results uh, that we had. Um, and that pattern of sort of, you know, showing a data set, uh, describing the model schematics, uh, showing the ROC curves, and then showing some postdoc visualization sort of became the template for a lot of deep learning papers uh, in the field. Um, and that uh, us and others have published since then, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of papers in the uh, in the vision science field using these models to do, you know, a pretty much uh, everything in every clinical condition imaginable. Um, so I, I want to sort of speed ahead to where I think uh, the field is sort of uh, moving right now. And there's a lot of dialogue about uh, a special class of deep learning models uh, called transformers. Uh, and so I want to explain that a little bit and then show some of the applications. Uh, so uh, this is um, a, uh, an ex a really good example of how a convolutional filter works. Um, and so these are uh, the st this was the state of the art uh, before transformers came into the picture. Uh, the models would learn uh, these weights. They would be systematically applied and convolved across the image. And then the resulting uh, output would be then sent to the next layer of convolutional filters. Uh, the advantage of this uh, was that the models only needed to learn these parameters, these nine parameters while processing an image instead of uh, taking every pixel position uh, as, a, as a single neuron um, like it was done with the fully uh, connected models before. Uh, Transformers is a completely different way of thinking and they actually came uh, from the uh, natural language processing field. Uh, so what happened was that uh, the NLP field was watching jealously as the computer vision field was leaping ahead with these convolutional models. Uh, because you couldn't use these convolutional filters uh, to process text. Uh, they really required a spatial coherence in pictures. Um, and so the NLP world developed uh, a technique called transformers, and it was in this seminal paper from uh, the Google Brain Group, uh, where they described a model, uh, a, a special type of neuron uh, called, um, uh, uh, called uh, attention heads. And the idea of an attention head was that you would break down things into queries and keys and the model would learn to ask questions and query things out from tokens. That was really the, uh, the idea here is that the model would learn given a set of queries and keys, how to pull out information uh, from a series of tokens. And uh, this uh, technology first um, showed the greatest promise with the translation task. So given a sentence in English, can you turn it into uh, French or vice versa? And, and so here, uh, what you're seeing is this token by token generation of a, a sentence that was, um, that, uh, was originally in French and being uh, turned into English. Um, this uh, caused basically the, the entire field of translation to change overnight. Um, and uh, the state of the art rapidly became uh, these encoder decoder models uh, that use transformer networks underneath uh, to do their work. Uh, what happened uh, is that uh, OpenAI um, took this idea and they started building a series of models called GPT. Uh, and GPT, all it was, was uh, uh, millions and millions of these transformers uh, late, uh, neurons uh, stacked in many, many, many layers. And um, uh, it, it, a couple of years ago, you know, in 2020 or so, GP3, uh, GPT-3 was released uh, and all this dialogue about, you know, uh, fake news articles and, um, and generated text, uh, it, it, it first sort of occurred in 2020 and then now with uh, GPT-4, it's really sort of taken off and hit the mainstream. Uh, but uh, this was very powerful uh, for its time. It was a leap ahead. Uh, there was an open source effort that took GPT-3 and made a, an open source uh, version of it. 
we took that model and we took the ophthalmology uh, full text research articles, about 23,000 of them, and we uh, created a library of 60 billion tokens. And we fine tuned this GPT Neo uh, on ophthalmology research text. Uh, and so we demonstrated that we could actually generate full text of fake opth uh, ophthalmology research articles. Uh, to make sure that this wasn't cheating somehow, we uh, actually found a uh, plagiarism detection software. Uh, and we uh, uh, systematically took the, the generated articles and made sure that they were very, very different uh, from uh, uh, the articles that were in the, uh, in the uh, tokenized library. So here is an example um, of uh, generated text on the left uh, from um, our model, and then on the right, the nearest closest match by plagiarism detection. Um, uh, and as you can see, um, the model's uh, very, very different from its closest match, but also actually describing, uh, you know, uh, statistics um, and, and sort of appropriately uh, so. So for example, this average IOP, uh, was 11.4 and the range is from 5 to 19. These are somewhat believable, you know, IOPs and a somewhat believable uh, average IOP. Uh, under It uh, uh, understood sort of what statistical test to run uh, given um, uh, visual acuity that's um, uh, not normally distributed and so on. Uh, it also found some seminal um, studies in our field and described uh, new sorts of hypotheses that could be uh, um, um, uh, tested uh, using that um, uh, uh, that sort of data, um, and uh, and so it's um, uh, was sort of a remarkable um, uh, model that we had trained, uh, but it's it was sort of unclear uh, what we could do with it. <laughs> I mean, it, it's very cool. Uh, don't get me wrong, and I think it's a it's an amazing feat of technology. Uh, but the actual application of it to make it useful, um, we weren't sure what what that was. Um, and so um, I started thinking about this a little bit. Uh, and I uh, one morning I woke up and I checked my inbox and there was about, you know, 50 emails from predatory journals um, uh, that had uh, hit my inbox. And so what I, I thought we could do uh, is gener curate a list of 15 predatory journals and start flooding them with these fake articles and, and then retracting them right before they're actually published um, and hopefully sort of flood that, uh, collapse that industry down. Um, I've yet to actually do this, uh, but uh, it was something that, uh, you know, I crossed my mind as an actual sort of useful use case uh, for this model. Uh, and then of course, you know, have it sort of generate its own article. Um, so that was, you know, 2020, 2021 or so when we had done, done that work. Um, GPT-4 uh, came out, um, or what's sort of called ChatGPT now. Uh, and this was an evolution from uh, GPT-3 that I just showed you to GPT-3.5 and now GPT-4. Uh, and um, what we know sort of happened is that somewhere in here, there was a reinforcement learning that occurred uh, with uh, the human feedback. Um, and there's some sort of adversarial uh, training that occurred, um, and we, but we don't know a lot of details about this. In fact, um, uh, there was this paper uh, that from OpenAI that was a, a, a technical report uh, that described uh, GPT-4 uh, and its behavior. And it seems to be sort of, usually when you, a group publishes a technical report like this, they include the methods of how they did things. Uh, but uh, the uh, computer science um, community rapidly realized that basically there was no details uh, in the paper and it was just 98 pages of uh, performance metric showing that it beat the state of the art. Um, and what's uh, interesting about this is that, um, you know, I thought uh, that somebody would figure out the secret sauce of how OpenAI uh, trained GPT-4. Um, in about, you know, six to nine months after they had achieved it. But even to this day, um, uh, you Google and, uh, and Facebook and uh, all the big tech giants are, are scrambling, trying to, trying to keep up uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with OpenAI. And so clearly there's something very special about the way that OpenAI trained this model uh, that gave it um, a, a performance that's head and shoulders above this, uh, the others uh, in the field today. So uh, there's lots and lots of papers about how ChatGPT might be used uh, in our field. Um, 
And uh, but there's a, this uh, sort of a big limitation about them, and I want to make sure that uh, uh, folks are well aware. Uh, so in order to actually train deep learning models, uh, they require a mathematical function that's uh, differentiable. Um, if you if it's if you can't take the first order derivative, uh, then you can't really uh, uh, perform stochastic gradient descent, and so then you can't actually train uh, any of these models. Uh, but the problem is that truthfulness uh, cannot yet be encoded uh, uh, as such a function. And so really, uh, large language models, um, uh, uh, it, you know, under the hood, all they are doing is mimicking human language and content. And they're trying to appease uh, the person who is um, uh, on the other side asking them the prompts. But there's really nothing that ensures that they give truthful answers. Um, and so that's really important to realize that uh, this is one of the biggest problems with LLMs. Um, and so ultimately, that might limit uh, what we can uh, what we can do with them. Um, last year, uh, uh, George Bartley asked me to give a presentation to the ABO, uh, and uh, in his email where he was um, uh, uh, asking me to kind of talk about different things, he. He said that uh, uh, the ability for candidates to cheat during our exams, um, especially if we continue with the Zoom administration, is particularly concerning. And at the time, I had no idea um, what he was talking about. <laughs> um, I, I was so busy thinking about what could be useful uh, things you could do with LLMs. I didn't think that people could use it in uh, to cheat uh, on the uh, on the oral exam. And so that that started uh, started uh, making me think about what um, uh, could be done. And so I started with thinking about, okay, so what would it take for uh, somebody who's taking the oral boards um, uh, to use Google to cheat uh, on the oral boards? Um, and so because the the examination is now administered over Zoom, uh, the candidates uh, necessarily have access to the internet. And so, they can't, because it's coming through video, they can't copy and paste uh, the question very easily. Uh, they would have to translate that question into a search query. And then they would have to scroll through all the results uh, and then find one uh, and read and process the different web pages to give the answer, all the while trying not to appear like they're cheating on Zoom. So this seems to be sort of pretty difficult and I can understand why uh, you know, given that we the oral board examination in its format, we can sort of see uh, the candidate and you know hear what they're doing. Uh, this seems pretty hard uh, to to actually do. So then, you know, I thought, okay, well, what would it take for someone to use ChatGPT to cheat on the oral boards? Uh, so they would still have access to the internet. You still can't copy and paste the answer. You'd have to retype the the question into the web interface uh, for uh, ChatGPT. Uh, you'd have to wait for the answer to be generated. Uh, you'd have to read and process that answer as it's generated word for word. Um, so that doesn't sound so easy, right? Uh, well, uh, let me play this um, uh, uh, thing uh, and I'll explain what's happening. So I wrote a, a little computer program here uh, that would look at the Zoom window at the bottom half of the screen and look for the uh, types of questions that appear here and send that through the API to uh, open AI. Uh, and then it would uh, it would then generate you know its uh, answers and look for changes in the state down here if the text uh, if the if the uh, screen changed and then submit a new question for um, uh, for to get an answer back. And what's really interesting here is that uh, ChatGPT is actually doing an amazing job at providing um, text that sound in the format of an oral board examination, uh, where we expect you know candidates to kind of go through the differential diagnosis, provide a workup, um, and uh, give the next sort of uh, steps that you would sort of um, uh, expect the person to do. Uh, in addition, it gets some of these sort of tricky questions correct. Um, it just just for clarity. Uh, these are ones that I made up uh, on my own. They, they're not actually oral board examinations. And then this last one is probably the most uh, um, interesting uh, in that it uh, understands this optics question. Uh, it finds the correct uh, lens equation, uh, puts in uh, the values, and then arrives at the correct uh, answer. Um, so it's sort of mind-blowing uh, that it can do this. Um, and then you might say, well, you know, only uh, Aaron Lee uh, can write a program like this. Um, but 
Uh, it's actually to do this. Um, it was only about you know ten or fifteen lines of Python code. Uh, it involved taking an OCR uh, library. Um, that's actually another deep learning model under the hood. Uh, and uh, it would uh, it asked uh, uh, GPT to uh, saying like you're an ophthalmologist taking the overboard examination for ophthalmology. You must describe the most likely diagnosis along with two other possible diagnoses. What tests you would order? Choose a final diagnosis. Describe what interventions you would recommend for the patient and uh, the urgency of those. And so that was the only prompting that uh, was done. Uh, and then afterwards, it's just a, the display of um, of the uh, of the generated text. Uh, so um, ironically, um, you know, one of the things that uh, GPT is really really good at is writing computer code. So um, uh, it's probably quite easy to ask GPT to generate this exact code uh, to cheat on the oral board examination. So uh, what would it take to use GPT? Well, actually not very much. Um, it might just look like they're sort of rereading this, uh, the question uh, at the top of their screen when they're actually reading uh, the answer that's being generated. So this is you know, a brave new world. Uh, the ABO, after I gave this uh, presentation, they are changing uh, the way that they are administering the exam to, which made it uh, made me feel much more comfortable showing this uh, to a broader audience. Um, so I want to spend the last bit of my talk talking about um, some of the work that we're doing right now uh, and uh, and where I think um, the field sort of needs to head. Uh, so uh, if you take a step back and you think about what data sets are really important for doing deep learning work, um, it's, uh, it's ones where we have a fair number of subjects uh, with relatively few key measurements. Um, and so this is a, 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 there's not actually a lot of data sets that exist out here uh, for doing uh, deep learning work. Um, there's there's uh, quite a few data sets on you know, 30 people or 40 people where we've done everything under the sun uh, to that, uh, to those folks, uh, but not a lot of data sets where we have like 3,000, 4,000, uh, and we've done a lot of different measurements. You also want um, the data sets to be balanced for sex, race, uh, and ethnicity so that there's not biases that are built into these models. And this is a gr very growing concern uh, as these deep learning models are being clinically deployed. Uh, so one very important data effort uh, that has been used uh, quite a bit um, uh, to uh, train deep learning models is the UK Biobank. Uh, this is an effort that was started in 2006 um, and even goes on uh, today. Uh, and they've done um, quite a, a few different measurements on uh, many, many people. And it's enough people to train uh, these models. Um, there's been you know 15 petabytes of data generated, uh, 2,000 ongoing uh, research projects, and uh, many many uh, high impact papers that have been published. Um, and so you know in our field uh, there there have been uh, many work that has been done, including this uh, uh, sort of uh, eye opening paper that when it was first published that showed uh, that you could predict uh, things like hemoglobin A1C, smoking status. Uh, age and uh, even um, uh, biologic sex from a color from this photo. And this relationship was um, something that uh, I think most clinicians were not aware of, uh, that you could predict just by looking at a color from this photo, you could predict the biologic sex uh, fairly accurately. Um, this concern of bias definitely does exist with the UK Biobank. And I want to stress this a, a little bit by showing you some data. Uh, so the way that UK Biobank was set up, it was done with convenient sampling. Um, and so that meant that they were willing to take anybody who is walk, willing to walk through the door to be part of the UK Biobank. And so even common diseases are fairly uncommon in the UK Biobank. And this is known as sort of a healthy volunteer bias. Um, it's also very heavily white British. In fact, it's 95% white British. Um, and so if you look at the average lifespan of a UK Biobank participant, uh, it's actually 10 years longer than the same UK population that it was drawn from. So there's an extreme, um, you know, healthy volunteer bias. In fact, I challenge you to think of a medical intervention that would give this amount of an effect um, uh, 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 in terms of uh, expanding somebody's lifespan. So. Uh, everything that we're basically learning from the UK Biobank uh, is on very healthy, 
very um, uh, very heavily white British uh, people. So there is a there is a big limitation with the UK biobank. Um, the NIH um, uh, uh, started this program called Bridge to AI, um, and it's a common fund level program, meaning that it's not tied to one institute. Um, and the remit of the program is to generate flagship data sets for uh, AI in medicine. Cecilia and I, um, in about two months, uh, we marshaled our vision. Basically, I thought of what I would want in a data set, given all the limitations that we had and experience that we had in training these models. Um, I thought of what would be sort of the best ideal model, uh, ideal data set uh, that we could construct uh, for training deep learning models. And we turned that into an 800 page application and we were ultimately one of the four data generation projects that were funded. Um, and so we are currently in year two of our four years um, uh, in the Bridge AI program. Uh, our data set or our project is called AI Ready and Equitable Atlas for Diabetes Insights. And the goal is to create a multi-dimensional ethically sourced data set in diverse people for studying salutogenesis in type two diabetes. Uh, if you hopefully understood most of the words in this goal, except for maybe the term salutogenesis. Uh, salutogenesis is really um, just the opposite of pathogenesis. We've spent a lot of time and energy studying how diseases develop and get worse. Uh, we spent uh, uh, probably less amount of effort trying to understand the reverse of this process of how can we get people back to a healthy state. So um, our project is uh, specifically targeting uh, this, uh, the, enabling uh, the ability to study salutogenesis in type 2 diabetes. Uh, we have assembled a very, very large team across the United States involving many, many different institutions. Many of these folks are leaders and giants outside of um, the field of ophthalmology uh, that uh, is part of our project. Um, the overall idea sort of came from the success of single cell RNA-seq. Uh, so what happens in single cell RNA-seq is that you get a transcriptome for every single cell uh, that uh, that is sequenced um, and you apply a dimension uh, a reduction technique, usually something like a UMAP, and it constructs these uh, pseudo time manifolds where uh, even though uh, this is uh, each individual cell is one uh, data point here, and the transcriptome of very similar cells are clustering together. Uh, and, uh, and then you can see sort of this evolution from embryonic to uh, terminally differentiated state. Um, what we hope to do is build a data set that is uh, scaled up uh, to the level of a human being um, and uh, collect a large cross-sectional data set uh, where um, uh, if we collect the relevant measures, a dimension reduction technique uh, like UMAP could be applied um, and hopefully we'll uh, start to see these uh, one-dimensional uh, manifolds uh, that uh, where one axis is healthy to disease and the other axis is pseudotime. Uh, to do this, um, we are intentionally sampling along the diabetes uh, spectrum. So um, we have a goal of recruiting about 4,000 participants where we are balancing for uh, race ethnicity. So a thousand of the folks will be white, a thousand black, a thousand Asian American, and a thousand Hispanic. Um, and then a thousand of these participants will be normal, a thousand lifestyle controlled diabetes, a thousand oral medication controlled, and a thousand insulin dependent. And within that, we want to achieve one-to-one -one, uh, balancing of biologic sex. Um, and so this hopefully will be a triple balanced uh, data set uh, the idea here is that if you train a model with the sum total of the data set, uh, you don't have to uh, worry so much about the bias in the model as with respect to race, ethnicity, and, and sex. Uh, we have three data collection sites, um, and we even have a goal to reach out to a, uh, uh, the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. Um, and we um, and see if they might be interested in um, uh, doing a similar data collection effort. Uh, so what are we actually doing in our data collection? Um, we're obviously collecting medical history, um, demographics and vitals, uh, a whole host of different blood and urine markers. Um, we're doing a battery of cognitive function testing, social determinants of health, depression screening, um, and we are uh, obtaining a 12-lead EKG, uh, different measures of visual function, a whole host of different forms of ophthalmic imaging, 
including uh, multiple device vendors for the same modality here. We're going to send them home uh, uh, with a, a, a Garmin uh, a fitness tracker as well as a continuous glucose device. Uh, they will uh, Participants are wearing this for about 10 days and then mailing them back. Uh, we built a custom environmental sensor that can measure air pollutants inside of their homes, uh, things like PM1, PM2, PM4, uh, temperature, humidity. Uh, and very interestingly, we included a 10-channel um, spectrometer, light spectrometer, so that we can measure the spectrum of light inside of people's homes. And with this combined with the activity fitness tracking data, uh, we can start to understand how uh, people's circadian rhythms are affected by different spectrums of light. Um, we're hoping at the end of the project that we'll have enough funds left over to do a whole genome sequencing on the 4,000 uh, participants. And we're banking a whole bunch of blood uh, at University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, the most important part of this is that we are actually hoping to publicly release as much of this data as possible. In fact, almost everything that you're seeing here, except for uh, the genetics and a couple, couple other things, uh, will be uh, publicly released. We're slated uh, to release our first uh, trench of data, which was from our pilot, uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, so this is not something like, you know, wait four years and you'll see something. Uh, we are um, uh, charged with releasing data as it's being generated. Uh, so we will hope to release our pilot data, which is about 200 participants uh, in, uh, the, in the next couple of months. And then uh, in the fall of this year, hopefully we'll release our first uh, 1,000 or so participants data. Um, so what we hope people will do is all sorts of really cool AI models, uh, things uh, 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 that hopefully will generate many, many hypotheses about uh, type 2 diabetes in the future and will lead to many, many discoveries, uh, both in, inside of our field and outside of our field. Um, we uh, sort of have this hope that people will take advantage of the biorepository that we're building. Um, and that we want any new data that is generated to be deposited back into this open repository. Uh, and really uh, what we want to do is accelerate data science and medicine. So what we are trying to do is build uh, enough documentation so that people who are not domain experts in, say, you know, cl continuous glucose monitoring data or in retinal imaging data, to be able to uh, 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 take our documentation and the data set and start to uh, do data science uh, with that data. Uh, so if you want to follow along uh, in our journey, this is our website uh, and our QR code. Uh, you're, uh, please, uh, you know, uh, uh, we want to hear from you as, uh, as we release this data. Um, there's a number of Arvo uh, posters that have been accepted this year in Seattle. Uh, and so uh, uh, please stop by and ask the folks uh, who are um, uh, intimately involved in this project about uh, what is going on. Um, I just want to end on a very positive note. Um, you know, I think with Michael Chang uh, uh, becoming the uh, National Eye Institute director, uh, there's going to be a, a bright future for data science uh, and um, and eye care as well as vision science uh, in the future. I think these methods are extraordinarily powerful. Uh, they can be used uh, to accelerate research uh, and uh, in many, many ways. And I think people, uh, we're just scratching the surface uh, even today of uh, how, how impactful these models can be. Uh, so I just wanna end by um, uh, thanking all my funding sources as well as uh, all the members uh, of my lab uh, and um, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. I guess I'll stop screen sharing so that I can actually see. <clears throat> so Aaron, let me start uh, with a relatively simple question and I'm not that familiar with your field, so that would be a great education for me. So the whole genome sequencing, you can correlate the sequence with anything you wish, not just disease but let's say the height, the weight, uh, to some degree, at least uh, some other generic features of the individuals. Uh, how far do you think we are uh, from, just from DNA that we can um, restructure or reconstruct a human being? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, 
Yeah, I guess. Do you mean reconstruct a human being uh, in silico versus? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I think um, I think we're very close, actually. So, you know, one uh, paper that we have currently under review um, took the UK Biobank and performed a uh, a a scan by a scan a GWAS across the macula. So, what we did is we took all the different uh, SNPs uh, in, uh, that was characterized uh, on the SNP chip from uh, UK Biobank. And for every A-scan position on the macular OCT uh, th that we had available from the UK Biobank, we studied uh, what genetic drivers uh, would influence the retinal thickness at each point in the macula. And by doing that, we could reconstruct uh, sort of a genetic atlas of what the drivers are for the retinal uh, height variance uh, across the UK biobank population. And when we did that, we were uh, sort of very surprised to discover how strong some of the signals were and how uh, spatially variant uh, the genetic drivers are. Um, and so um, um, I think, you know, what, what the other sort of cool aspect of that particular project, because it was uh, successful in, in being able to go in that direction from genetics, from, uh, from understanding that relationship, you can imagine reversing that equation uh, and being able to generate um, the thickness profiles or even the retinal, uh, different re retinal layer thickness profiles from, um, uh, from uh, uh, the SNP chip uh, uh, information. So I think um, that uh, idea actually has some legs. Um, and, you know, there's this whole field of uh, digital twins, uh, the idea of being able to understand and reconstruct um, all the different levers that drive a, a, a disease process in silico and manipulate that. So these ideas um, are uh, being actively uh, talked about and researched. And so I think um, I, I don't think we're uh, uh, as far away as uh, it may seem at, at, at first glance. Thank you very much. Let's go to Zoom and Dr. Saban. Hey, Aaron. Great talk. Um, I, I really, I really appreciated you you sharing how your intellectual curiosity sort of drives the specific projects that you're doing. I think that's fantastic. It's fun. It's fun to hear. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I have a question and, and it's, and since, since you've thought about, you know, dimensionality reduction with UMAPs and, and this may be a very silly question, but I'm just wondering, is it possible to take the imaging apparatus, uh, such as OCT, for example, all the data we have and somehow utilizing it for a completely unbiased sort of analysis like we would do with single cell RNA-seq. Um, and I don't even know where to approach that. One example that sort of crossed my mind is maybe you can get some, you know, you can get hundreds of spectral characteristics per pixel, for example, to generate some sort of data that has evenly scaled across the dimensions that you can then do a dimensionality reduction and compress and uh, be able to see things in more of an unbiased way rather than training the data set. Um, the pixel idea might not, may, may be ridiculous, but I'm wondering if you thought about it, is there some way to apply it? And, and, and if so, is it would it even have any utility? Yeah, great question. So. Um... We have uh, a paper that we published last year where we've tried to do some of this. Um, so uh, in uh, type two MACTEL, there's a very large effort, international effort from the MACTEL project uh, where they've collected, you know, OCTs um, on, you know, about 1100 people with uh, type two MACTEL. Uh, and what we did uh, is we were able to take um, a OCT uh, scans, actually more than I think one, I think it's about five OCT scan, B scans from the central area of the macula and uh, uh, compress that down to a single two dimensional dots uh, uh, using UMAP. Uh, it's a combination of deep learning to get down to a feature vector and then doing UMAP afterwards. Um, and what the really important sort of use case for that was, uh, is developing sort of a um, a continuous disease score, a spectrum. We know that human diseases are not 
uh, don't follow stages. Like they're not step functions. They don't suddenly go from stage one to stage two. Uh, there's some sort of continuous gradient across them. Um, and so we were trying to arrive at that using this method and we were successful. Um, so we showed in the paper that we were able to uh, arrive at a disease severity score uh, that uh, was uh, that we validated using uh, uh, clinical graders, uh, but most importantly, it's sort of taking this idea of um, can we can we take a step back and study human diseases more objectively uh, using uh, machine learning techniques like dimension reduction, um, and so I think that's a really important uh, push in the field, in my opinion, because. We are only going to rediscover what we already know if we continue to apply deep learning the way that we're doing right now. In order to push the boundaries of what we don't know, you absolutely have to take these sort of uh, next steps where you push the models to do things beyond um, our, our current framework of understanding. Thank you. And I think that the, it, it's a low hanging fruit with all the algorithms now, like trajectory analysis and whatnot that can be potentially applied. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to look for that paper. Thank you very much. Sure. Hey, so I just had a, a comment in the chat. Uh, first of all, Aaron, great, great talk. Um, I was fortunate to be able to attend the AUPO annual meeting just a couple of weeks ago. I know Barry was there, Vlad was there. Um, I, there was a great session the last day of the uh, meeting on AI applications and ophthalmology. Paul Chan uh, was chairing that session, spoke in that session. There were some several great talks. Um, and what I learned is that it's AI education is already being implemented in medical school curricula. And uh, the, the next wave is ophthalmology residency programs. Some are already incorporating this, but it seems to me this is the future that's now. Uh, everybody needs to get on board to learn about this technology and using it. From my own standpoint of being an editor of a journal, I am confronted every day by chat GPT, faux manuscripts, um, questions about plagiarism and what have you. Uh, it is um, a headache, uh, but uh, it also could be a great help uh, for people to be able to improve their quality of their writing, at least, um, and also the original uh, research on which it's based. Um, yet the other, the other aspect that I worry about is um, the application of AI, it, it, you have to teach the, the program to learn the data. Um, is it going to be a question where AI is going to be correcting physicians or researchers on their conclusions or inter interpretation of original data? Or are the researchers and clinicians going to have to correct the AI? Yeah, so uh, great points and questions. So let me start by talking about the education uh, piece. So um, the uh, I, the a so one of the hats I wear is overseeing uh, the AEO AI committee, uh, and uh, what we did uh, recently in the last couple of years is we wrote a chapter. Uh, on digital ophthalmology, uh, and we made that uh, uh, um, a chapter as part of the BCSC series. Uh, and so uh, it is, uh, um, as of two editions ago, um, it is now formally part of the ophthalmo ophthalmology residency uh, core curriculum in the United States. Um, and what we hope will happen is that people will start to use uh, that uh, that curriculum as well as you know sort of grow it right now it's just one chapter but it could very easily grow to be its own volume in the future uh, because it's starting to touch and intersect with uh, basically every part of you know, the ophthalmology training process um, I I do think that um, you know these uh, models are 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 sort of here to stay uh, I I thought actually uh, that uh, uh, when we first, um, uh, uh, when I first touched uh, deep learning, that it was going to be a fad, um, I, that it was just sort of a, a, a technology flavor of the month, uh, but I was very wrong. Um, these models are actually very, very powerful. Uh, and they can find and tease things out in data sets that uh, we were not aware of before. 
So I think they can be used uh, to your point uh, for hypothesis generation, um, where you think that there should be a difference between sort of these two different groups of people or these different uh, uh, disease states, um, but you're not sure what they are. Uh, I think deep learning can actually help uh, uh, find those, um, uh, find th what those factors are. So uh, uh, whether it, it's going to replace clinicians or replace their judgment, um, uh, I think to a certain extent, uh, that's, uh, uh, that uh, may not be a terrible thing. Um, uh, there are uh, certainly ways that you can use AI models that have been vetted uh, safely um, f uh, where they hopefully will raise the standard of care um, uh, in areas where there's sort of uh, uh, a lack of avail available clinical expertise. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm thinking of um, uh, uh, folks who uh, are in, you know, third world countries uh, trying to deploy, uh, you know, medical systems. Uh, it, it, they may not have access to an ophthalmologist at all. Uh, and, uh, and having some of these models available to triage uh, people and, and construct efficient healthcare delivery systems may be a really fantastic use case, actually. So um, I, I do think that uh, there's a, a, a place and a role for each one of the things that you said, and it's not as scary as you might think. So that's, that's great. And and just you just touched on something that I didn't think about previously. Uh, a telemedicine and uh, being in contact with people that are far removed from a uh, primary uh, clinical site, helping doctors that are maybe thousands of miles away uh, to interpret data that's right in front of them and presenting as patients. Yeah, exactly. And actually the first US uh, FDA clearance of a fully autonomous AI model is uh, in the field of diabetic retinopathy screening. So. These are models that are being deployed in primary care offices where uh, uh, today, uh, where there's not a clinician uh, looking over those images and it's an AI model giving the interpretation right back to the primary care physician. So this is happening in the US today right now. Very cool. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Brian. Yeah, so that last discussion sort of Zeke by question on, on, on telemedicine, but, but, but let me, let me, uh, let me ask Aaron his thoughts on sort of a, a broader sort of future uh, aspect of this. Um, I mean, our AI is only as good as our training data, right? Mm -hmm. And and I guess one of my concerns is that we in science and medicine are becoming dependent upon this large business case model of ingesting data that is going to be dependent upon protected health information on intellectual property. Um, and I mean, I'm old enough to remember Napster and, and how that whole business model like completely fell apart. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the continuing sort of scaling of, of AI and, and, and our dependency upon, upon this business model? Because like everybody is, I mean, it's, it's interesting because um, you know, open AI sort of forced everybody's hands, right? Because people were developing these models and then open AI released it to the public. And, and, and now every aspect of, of our economy, people are chasing AI. Um, how's, how's, how's this going to impact us in science and medicine? Yeah, I think that future is yet to be written. Like it's very unclear exactly how uh, this technology is going to be um, either constructive or disruptive uh, in, in the field of science. Um, one of the uh, points I always sort of like to make about what OpenAI did um, is, uh, you know, so before OpenAI released ChatGPT, um, the average person on the street had probably read a news article about deep learning or AI and, you know, some context like self-driving cars or, you know, automated disease models or something. Um, but they probably never had actually interacted with a deep learning model. Um, one of the things that OpenAI did uh, is they released ChatGPT essentially to the world. Like the average human being, all they needed was an internet connection. And all of a sudden they could actually directly personally interact with a deep learning model on the other side. Uh, and at that moment in time, I think there were two things that could have happened. Um, 
people could have either walked away very disappointed uh, by the the state of the art that, you know, all this stuff that they had been reading about AI and how cool it was when they actually went to use it uh, for their use case, um, they they were they could have walked away just dis- so, sourly disappointed uh, um, with sort of this crash of heightened expectations versus reality. Um, or they could have walked away impressed. And that's actually what happened. Like people walked away from their first interaction with, with ChatGPT excited and impressed uh, um, about what they had just experienced. And I think that moment in human history is really, really important uh, because uh, it, 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 it opened the sort of the box uh, of AI and brought that tool set to a level where all you needed was an internet connection and to be able to type into a box to interact with a, a deep learning model. So that, uh, democratization of AI technology is, uh, I think, what is giving rise to all this chatter about what it could be, be doing in all these different parts of human society. Uh, but really, I think we're still grappling with what those use cases are, what the limitations of these models are, uh, and how far we can push them. So um, there's, you know, I mentioned that the biggest problem with these is really the fact that they don't, they're not constrained to give you the truth um, or any factual information. Uh, there are uh, more d- methods being developed, uh, like there's this retrieval augmented generation technique, uh, where instead of the model just freely generating text, um, it actually has to generate a query to, to search a known database and then takes the results of that database and, and, and provides it to the user. And that technique does constrain the model to give you factual information, but it's limited to what's in that database now. and so. So that's where uh, there's pros and cons. Um, but we're in a very exciting time, uh, I'll be honest. I think this is, uh, we're seeing, witnessing an acceleration of AI technology um, at, at a rate that I think um, uh, is just uh, increasing, if anything. So it's a, it's a very exciting time. All right, uh, Kathy, you have some comments? Kathy, are you there? Hi, oh, I yes. think Kathy, yeah. Hey, Kathy, uh, go ahead. Hi, Aaron. A great talk as always. Um, I think you've mentioned the the highlights from the paper. This I'm part of the MacTel research group with Aaron, and uh, being able to generate a continuous severity scale for this disease and others just based on an OCT scan and a deep learning model, I think will really accelerate our understanding. We've got big data sets for this disease of. Um, matching clinical data, metabolomic data, genetic data, and having a continuous severity score for this disease rather than humans giving us seven level severity scale will, I think, accelerate our learning in this space. I think somebody asked HOMA models. I'm not aware of any, but it, that would be an obvious next ophthalmic step. But there are so many other diseases where imaging data sets could be um, analyzed in this way to, con- to give a continuous severity score on CT scans of the brain, um, chest x-rays, those kind of things. So um, I think this kind of principle could expand to many other areas of medicine. Great, thank you. And we have a question from nameless person, uh, 745 I wonder if that's me. Yeah. No. Okay. Michael. Uh, I... Well, this is Mike Gorman, but I don't know if it was me coming up with that weird number. I did raise my hand. I'm a little bit concerned that like when you make a binary distinction, like it's either diabetic retinopathy or not, you miss the fact that most people have mixed pathology of other diseases. And it would be far better if AI systems dealt with probabilities rather than trying to make binary or even thin decision making. And I wanted you to know to what extent are people modifying the AI systems to really be more probabilistic and mm. to be aware of the fact when there's a deviation off of what it would normally predict at some degree? Yeah, um, great question. So uh, there's a, actually an entire field of deep learning research um, around uh, developing models that can tell us uncertainty. So, um, you know, one of the things that people have done in the past is that they take the uh, soft max regression that comes out and treat that as a probability. That's actually incorrect to do uh, because um, the models are trained to squash everything towards zero and one. 
and make a binary decision, just like you said. Uh, so there's an entire field of research uh, uh, that studies uncertainty. They've broken down uncertainty into two different um, concepts. One is aleatoric and one is epistemic. Uh, and the, uh, the way to train these models in a probabilistic fashion in, involves uh, uh, you know, a, a class of deep learning models uh, called Bayesian uh, deep learning models where uh, they can give you a um, sort of a, a posterior distribution of the probability of their decisions. Uh, and so uh, this, this is an active field of research and it's one that people understand is really important because if you're going to trust uh, an AI model, it's important that it is uncertain in the same way that a human being is uncertain. Um, and that's that's something that I think a lot of people often forget, uh, but it is a very important uh, aspect of a trustworthy AI system is that it fails and is in, and, and is uncertain in the same way that a human clinician is uh, it fails or is uncertain. And so I think um, you know we need to see more models like that being developed in our field um, uh, then rather than just training these binary classifiers or multiple class classifiers. All right, uh, let's have the last three questions from Zoom and then we have four questions from the room. Uh, so let's just speed up a bit. Uh, Ting Li. Hello, Dr. Li. So I'm a PhD student in NIH and I've been following AI papers, but it's becoming very complex lately. Like for example, Piers Keen and you have co-authored on the Red Fund publishing Nature in 2023. So my question is, as we move towards visual transformers and peers is refining the models to have mask autoencoders, does it mean the, that we still need to uh, supply labeled, uh, labels to the model or do we don't need to do that anymore? Thank you. Sure, great question. So yes, the uh, Rhett found paper, uh, it's, a, it's, a remar it's a great achievement for you know, our field. Uh, that is something that we've been working on could rise to that level. Um, of attention in the scientific community. Um, the um, red found in particular was trained in a self-supervised uh, fashion, meaning that uh, it's this mask autoencoder uh, where given a large data set, um, you can train the model to just reconstruct different uh, areas that you intentionally mask. And just by uh, training in that fashion, it develops weights that are important uh, to have a visual feature understanding of what's in uh, that domain of images. Um, if you want to then take that model and do something with it, you absolutely need labels, right? So just taking red found uh, out of the box um, and uh, and trying to give it, uh, trying to have it give a, a diagnostic uh, capability of, you know, say macular degeneration or not, or diabetic retinopathy or not, uh, it won't do that because it's just trained to reconstruct images. Uh, but then if you take that model, um, and uh, and then uh, fine tune it. Uh, so use it as a starting point and you don't need very much data at all uh, to achieve state of the art performance. And that's one of the really important things is that uh, foundation models is supposed to be a foundation that you build upon. And so it gets you much closer to where you need to go. Uh, and it doesn't uh, require as large of a training set uh, anymore uh, to train uh, well-performing deep learning models because we have uh, such a powerful starting point. Um, so I think uh, that's the sort of the right way to think about that body of work. Um, uh, if you want to train your own foundation model, then yes, all you need is huge, huge amounts of data without any labels and you can you can train a foundation model. Um, but if you want to do something useful with it, uh, you, still, you still need labels. Ronald. Hi, Dr. Lee, that was a really great talk. Um, I had a question just really, um, I know the presentation was really showing uh, all the really cool things, but something that you know we're always uh, looking at in my field of imaging um, is validation uh, because the uh, models are really good at uh, showing all these associations and uh, correlations, but not really, um, you, can't, you can't really tell like how it's being made, uh, especially through these diffusion models. Um, is there any kind of metrics or like more analysis to like the embedding spaces of uh, how these associations are being made and how that uh, pertains to disease detection? Thank you. Yeah, so so um, uh, so great question. There's sort of two different concepts embedded in your question. 
Uh, so one concept is this uh, aspect of validation and how do we know, how do we validate these uh, black box models? Um, the current uh, state of the art is to find an out of this, like a, a, a ideally a, a held out test set that is from a totally different population. So this is very similar to, you know, how we think about validation of genetic results in general. Um, we, we try to find another population somewhere else on the planet uh, that uh, where we can uh, recapitulate that association. Um, that is a similar pattern to how we think about uh, validating these black boxes. Uh, we want to see similar performance um, in a different population um, that was captured by different photographers, different patients, different clinical systems, and the model still behaves the same. So there's an aspect of both robustness and uh, and um, and and uh, validation of uh, of model performance. So I think that is um, a really important part. Um, the second part about the embeddings, uh, yes. So another aspect to understand deep learning models and why they work is to look at that embedding space. So most of the models have a bottleneck area uh, where the models are distilled down to a smaller feature space. And taking that feature space and pulling it apart and understanding it uh, can help you understand why the model is doing what it's doing. Um, and uh, and in some ways uh, can also be used to detect when it's um, the model is being used for a use case that is outside of the distribution that it was trained for. So those are aspects that, um, uh, you know, the our field in uh, in um, the medical AI space have, have not really taken advantage of yet, in my opinion but I'd love to see more work uh, in that area. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, wonderful talk, that was super interesting. Um, you, and during your talk, you alluded a little bit to the, the secret sauce that OpenAI has and, had and has. Um, I just wanna kind of pick your brain. To what degree do you think uh, the data they generated from that public release, like the research, um, preview uh, and just recording the public interactions. Like, do you think that the secret sauce that is being withheld is, you know, in some way related to all the data that they've generated, right? Like that lead is, you know, attributable to that. Yeah. I mean, so um, it's a good question and we don't know the answer to that, quite honestly. We don't know what OpenAI is doing with the recordings of the chat transcripts uh, between users and its uh, platform. Uh, there's an option to say, I don't want my data to be held on by OpenAI, uh, which implies that the rest of the data is being used for training models. Um, uh, so it's sort of clear that they are using the human interaction uh, with the models to uh, 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 to train their next generation of models. So that's, that is cl clearly going on. Um, we one of the interesting um, uh, uh, sort of side comments I'll make about this situation that we are facing right now is that uh, all of a sudden the tech giants have uh, reverted back to their 1990s behavior. Uh, if you look at what's going on, uh, they are they are terrified of each other and the competition right now. So uh, before OpenAI, everybody was publishing these uh, beautifully written methods papers. Um, that described in great detail the technology and the innovation uh, that they were developing. Some of the best research papers in the field of deep learning were coming from, you know, uh, Meta and from uh, uh, from Google uh, and from um, uh, Amazon. But now, all of a sudden, all those companies have stopped publishing papers. Uh, they they and they they view this to be a competitive landscape again because they understand that they're, the future of their company is at stake. Um, and so they've reverted back to this sort of 1990s Microsoft uh, kind of uh, competitive mindset, and they've clamped up in terms of under, uh, releasing how they're training uh, their models. For example, uh, Gemini uh, is Google's latest advance in LLM. We, we don't know how it was trained. Um, uh, and so it, it'll be interesting to see um, how the tech giants sort of react uh, to the shifting landscape um, and uh, and whether the academics will ever, um, uh, you know, uh, be privy to understanding what's going on. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful 
discussion. We have a very quick uh, four questions from the room. Uh, John, Emily, Cesare, and Roman. Hello, I'm John. Um, thank you for this great talk on the ethical use of AI and the use of applications of AI. Um, you mentioned uh, later in your talk about salutogenesis. Do you see anything promising from your end on like its potential use for um, improvement in health due to medication or lifestyle or other factors that might improve health? Um, is that something that you're observing from, from your end? Um, and what's the promise there? Yeah. So we don't know um uh, is the short answer so the um uh, one of the important things about um uh, the bridge to ai program is that we are not allowed to do research on the data that we are generating before it's released so they wanted us to be very focused on data generation for the public good to accelerate data science they did not want us to repeat the pattern uh, that that usually occurs of PIs uh, promising to release data, but instead, you know, publishing all these high impact papers about their data set and taking all the low hanging fruit uh, first before they share the data set. They wanted that model to be reversed. So I have not looked uh, at our data or analyzed it at all. We've been so focused on trying to get our data ready for public release uh, so that others can use it easily uh, and do that kind of research um, uh, I have not been, uh, I've, I've not looked for that, uh, salutogenesis signal. Hi, Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you so much for this awesome talk. I learned a lot. Um, with programs such as ChatGPT being so readily available now, um, similar to how we have plagiarism checkers, how good are these programs at actually spotting if their own program wrote, you know, like a, an entire manuscript? Yeah. So um, there's a, another field of research uh, in the uh, NLP world uh, is trying to build uh, detectors of LLM generated articles. And that and usually involves another LLM. Um, and so what's, what's, what's happening is that there's this cat and mouse game because what will happen is somebody will say, you know, I've uh, found a way to detect your, uh, your model generating uh, uh, natural language text. Uh, and then that model creator will then take what they've done and include that as a loss in their in their model and finally train the model in a way that will defeat uh, that detection technique. And then and then somebody else will come up with another detection technique. And so there's this sort of, uh, so, sort of this arms race going on between the two sides of uh, trying to uh, trying to detect um, uh, and defeat that uh, detection. So it's a it's an evolving field of research. Um, uh, I think uh, on the image generation side with the diffusion models, it's a little simpler. Uh, it, it's it's sort of clear when you look at some of these uh, images coming out of Dolly or Midjourney or whatever you're using that they have a certain flavor to them. Uh, and a human being can very easily t tell uh, when um, uh, they, uh, uh, the models are, are being used uh, to generate this. Um, I, I, I haven't, I didn't talk very much about those image generation diffusion models uh, in my talk. Um, but it also is an in interesting and a remarkable advancement in technology. Uh, I think it was only two years ago when uh, those generated images were generating images of people with like six or seven fingers. Uh, they couldn't figure out, you know, uh, in the implicit. So what that implies is that there's an implicit relationship that's hidden in the in the image uh, that is important for it to be, a, 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 you know, a well generated image that was not. <clears throat> that's not easy to encode in a loss function, if you think about it. Uh, it, it. There's all these aspects of what is considered to be a realistic image. Um, and so the fact that these models now are have evolved to a state where they can they can very easily generate human beings with five fingers now, uh, it's uh, it, in such a short period of time is another sort of benchmark of how fast the field is moving. Thank you, Cesare. Hello, Dr. Lee. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Uh, earlier, you mentioned about the FDA-approved algorithm to diagnose diabetes um, retinopathy. I have a question. Um, how far or how close are we to models that not only diagnose the patients, but also choose or help us choose the correct um, drugs or combination of drugs for more precise treatment? Yeah. So um, you can, as you can imagine, the pharma companies are very interested in that line of research, uh, and they are... 
uh, really, really focusing on a lot of their development uh, in trying to build models that can do that. Um, now, what sort of, uh, 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 and there's various sort of strategies I can talk about, but one of the key things to realize about why that is a harder problem than it may seem is that it requires uh, the models understanding what the counterfactual is when the, the counterfactual is not present. So what, what I mean by that is that if you have uh, a patient A going through in your data set and they, they were treated with drug X, um, you have that data. So you can you can sort of understand what happened to them when they when they were treated on drug X. But you don't have the data of what that person um, uh, uh, would have done uh, or uh, how they would have uh, behaved if they were treated with intervention Y or drug Y. Uh, so there's a counterfactual arm there that is missing. And what the models have to implicitly learn to do is to identify somebody else uh, in that latent feature space that is very similar to patient A that was treated with drug Y, and then try to extrapolate that uh, information back onto um, uh, 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 patient A. And so it, there's a few gaps there that make it make that problem harder than it seems. Um, and so um, I do think that, uh, you know, uh, someone is going to uh, 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 make a breakthrough in that area. Uh, and we will end up with um, uh, models that hopefully can recommend uh, treatment options and, and tailor interventions to the patient that's sitting in front of you when you're in clinic. Thank you. I know there are many great questions awaiting us, but we will finish with Raman's question. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your wonderful presentation. Raman. Yeah. Hello, um, um, Dr. Lee, very nice talk. I can see a great progress in this field. Uh, I have a little bit naive question. Uh, uh, currently, for sure, there are some limitations. Uh, what's the main limitation? Uh, it's uh, availability of good hardware or it's uh, availability of new models, like software? Um, great question. And I actually think it's neither of those things. I think it's the availability of good data, right? And so I think we as a field lack um, a large well curated data sets that can be used to uh, to train deep learning models and uh, ideally benchmark them on the sort of the same grounds um i think one of the things that happens right now is that uh, group a will publish a paper saying that their model is great uh, and they validated it uh, within their hospital system but no one else has access to that uh, benchmarking uh, data set then group B will say, no, our model is better and here are the performance metrics, but they're not really doing an apples to apples comparison of the models. Um, and, and that makes it very difficult to iterate on methods because you never know which methodology or model architecture is better. Uh, you are always left guessing uh, that, you know, uh, that model A or model B might be better or worse for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, and so that's why I think for our field to move forward, it's very important to have benchmarking data sets uh, where we can um, uh, uh, understand what the true state of the art is given, uh, a, a, given a model and a problem. Okay. Please join me to thank our speaker today.